Thanks. Hey everybody, my name is Aubrey and I'm an opera singer and voice coach. I just wanted to start this video off with a huge thank you to everyone who found my previous video, who liked and commented and subscribed. I really appreciate it. I totally made that video because I wanted to learn a new skill during quarantine and that skill was video editing. I have always enjoyed watching YouTube videos. I have been invited on a lot of projects where basic video editing skills were needed and I was like, you know, what better time than right now? right? So I really appreciate it. I made those videos months ago, but I'm really excited that you guys enjoyed them, even though they were mostly just a fun project for myself. So now I hope to be able to make content that brings joy to everyone and hopefully teaches a little bit about the opera world and everything that's related and not related in the world of music. So, long story short, feel free to continue asking questions down below in the comments section. Feel free to like and subscribe, share if you feel so inclined, and if you ever find yourself in the position of wanting to learn how to sing, feel free to reach out. You can take lessons at the link below. Now on to some questions that I've gotten over social media and in the comments section of my previous videos. What operas do you recommend? Oh, well, it does depend on who's asking, doesn't it? <laughs> But fundamentally, I guess I'm just gonna talk about my personal favorites. Number one is by Heggie and it's Dead Man Walking. I uh, really love this opera. It's very, very beautiful. It's just this absolutely gut-wrenching story about a man on death row. And it's, it's just fused with some of the most beautiful music. It sounds very nostalgic and yet also very new. So it's, it's a great opera. I cried the whole time, basically. The next that I would recommend is H.L. Freeman's opera Voodoo. It's really, really beautiful as well. I love some of the fusions of different styles of music. It's wonderful. It's, it's taking place in Reconstruction era Louisiana. Oh. The next is Wozzeck, which is Alban Berg's avant-garde opera, and it's very beautiful. I really love it. It's, it's just very passionate as well. Another is Carlisle Lloyd's Susanna. I think it's a really beautiful piece. One of my favorite arias is Ain't It a Pretty Night. It's gorgeous. Another one is Missy Mazzoli's Proving Up. I think it's a really cool commentary uh, on being a Midwesterner during the time that it's written. And last but not least, I love Douglas Moore's Ballad of Baby Doe. I get a lot of people who make fun of me for this, but I just like it. I think the music is pretty, uh, so I do think that everyone who's interested in dipping their toe in versus jumping in and cannonballing into opera, I'd probably recommend looking at operettas, which are small operas. Something like Pauline Viardot's Cendrillon or uh, Strauss's Die Fledermaus, those are really great options. Number one favorite opera. Okay, it changes as I see new pieces, but right now it's actually Dog Days by David T. Little, I saw this performance and it was unbelievable. I love horror movies, it's my favorite genre, so I definitely am a little biased towards this like apocalypse vibe, but it was very cool. Would highly recommend if you're looking for something flat out unnerving. How to get ready for performances? This is a great question. The easy answer is I warm up, but that's not a very good answer. So, you know, I like to have my content memorized as much as possible so that I can focus more on entertaining the audience than the mechanics of the song itself. So it helps me to give a better performance that's slightly more authentic. That being said, I like to drink a lot of water before everything. I try to increase my water intake a couple days before the performance so that I can feel like my natural lubrication is a healthy amount so that I don't dry out halfway through a performance. So rather than drinking water during my performance, because I find that actually dries me out a little bit more by washing away that good gunk, I actually choose to drink a more oily alternative. I choose unsweetened almond or coconut milk. It just kind of helps me feel more naturally lubricated, which I like because as you're singing, your vocal cords are doing this over and over again. It's exhausting and, and very drying. So, you know, I like to try and stay as hydrated as possible. I found some information from Dr. Leslie Childs from UT Southwestern Medical Center. So I, I will quote those a little bit, but I also put the full article down there if you want to read more. She had a lot of really great things to say. And I quote, 
The most important thing that we can consume to improve vocal health is water. Staying hydrated helps your body produce thin, watery mucus. Your vocal cords vibrate more than 100 times per second when you speak, and they need that mucus to help them stay lubricated. We recommend drinking 64 ounces of water each day. If you enjoy a caffeinated or alcoholic drink, you will need to add more water to your daily consumption. Now, I'm a big coffee drinker, so I do have to be careful. I try my best to drink as much water as I possibly can, but yeah, it is hard sometimes to stay on top of the drinking of water. Is the stigma around opera going away? I would say the answer to that is both yes and no. For example, institutions like the Metropolitan Opera are really, really forward thinking in terms of providing streamed operas for people who want to go to movie theaters and see stuff. I have seen a couple of them. They're pretty neat. I've also seen smaller companies make things a little bit more affordable, a little bit more intimate, which is also really cool. I like being able to see those smaller houses have a really full audience. It brings me a lot of joy. But inherently, opera is still very focused on Western musical traditions as well as targeting a slightly wealthier audience. Does that mean all opera is like this? No. There's a ton of opera out there that doesn't fall into those categories, but it doesn't really get highlighted nearly as often as like Puccini or Wagner or Mozart. There's also a lot of other stigmas that have been largely swept under the rug for many, many decades, even centuries, uh, which are currently at the forefront of a lot of the discussions happening, at least what I'm seeing in our personal Facebook pages, other singers and, and stuff like that. Things like ticket costs, opera's relationship to technology, the breakdown of composers who have stage time, racism, sexism, ableism, and, and many, many more. And we as an art form have a lot of growing to do. We also have a lot of work to do, and we have a lot of humbling to do. For people who are curious about breakdowns of performances by composer, feel free to check out the link below for a website called Opera Base. It's a really quick place to get a basic understanding of how biased opera can be, and hopefully we can change the programming together if we continuously ask houses to celebrate composers from a variety of different backgrounds, develop more diverse admin teams and programming directors, and consequently, purchasing tickets for these kinds of shows. The dollar speaks volumes. A positive thing that's happened, though, in 2019, the Met did announce that for the first time in their history of 136 slash seven years, depending on when people are seeing this, the Opera House would put on the first ever composition by a black composer. And I'm very excited to see it. I've been hearing a lot of really good conversations about it. That means for the 2021-2022 season, we're going to be seeing Terrence Blanchard's fire shut up in my bones on that stage. It's gonna be very exciting. I'm super pumped. <laughs> Music from different communities is terribly underrepresented in opera. So we're talking new composers, BIPOC composers, LGBTQIA composers, female composers, non-binary composers. We're seeing a massive disparity between their opportunities and the opportunities of composers who have been gone for a while. Fundamentally, the house wants to sell tickets and it's hard to ignore the power of name recognition. The problem is, by not featuring works by modern composers, we fail to communicate properly with our modern audiences, and it's, it's very hard for us to connect to modern viewpoints. And consequently, we run the risk of stagnating our art form. This is a wildly condensed run-through of some of the hot-button topics facing opera right now. So I apologize if I wasn't able to give you all of that. I just don't want to spend too long on any one question. I plan on making videos talking a little bit about these kinds of things and inviting some of my colleagues and friends uh, and talking about how these kinds of issues affect them personally because I think that there's only so much that I can speak on effectively. I, I'm excited to see where opera's going and I'm excited to see how we can work to connect with you guys, <laughs> all of you. And I will provide some of that for you guys in the description below. Any advice for younger singers? Oh, yes. The people that you're studying with have absolutely gone through the trials and tribulations that you are going through today. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Try and find what makes you happiest as an artist and focus on those things first. Everything else will slowly start falling into place. That being said, 
please make sure to look into tangentially related careers as well. I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to do that. So I was taking music business classes and musicology classes. You know, even though sometimes I can't be performing actively right now, I can still fall back on these other interests that I've been able to foster. So I genuinely enjoy them. I am able to stay in music even though I'm not performing actively. And I feel really satisfied. I feel more comfortable and confident. So, you know, always make sure that you're fostering a backup. There are so many careers out there. You don't ever have to leave the music world if you don't want to or if performing just doesn't fit perfectly for you. There's no shame in not wanting to perform all the time. There's lots of options. Also, remember that community is everything. Try and build a community around you of colleagues that you like collaborating with that are really, really nice and positive. And hopefully you can create a community that is even better for the next generation of musicians to join. Next question, can I still take lessons if I'm an adult? Yes, 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 100,000% yes. I probably will make a whole video just talking about adult lesson taking because I am so passionate about it. People love to use the phrase, old dogs can't learn new tricks, but in reality, I, I don't think that it's that. I think it's the awareness of the pain that comes from failure that is preventing people from taking the risk that they need. I think I might have touched upon it on another video, which I will try and put somewhere, but it's kind of this idea that we, we recognize quite early on what we're good at and we kind of keep doing that because it, it reinforces a positive sensation in us. So we kind of end up shying away from things that are risky or slightly different from that. And as a result, we miss out on opportunities. So, you know, at a certain point in our development, we actually end up creating a pattern that we know works, but ends up stifling creativity. Learning how to make music is definitely not constrained to any particular age or time period. It's, it's more attached to willingness and discipline and determination and, and just a general sense of fearlessness. I definitely feel like a lot of my adult students actually learn better than kids because they appreciate what it means to practice. They also are putting money and time into it, which is valuable as you get older. And they honestly, genuinely enjoy it. It's something that they already enjoy. They don't need to learn how to enjoy it. Sometimes, at least for me, when I was taking lessons as a kid, I didn't really enjoy it. I hated taking piano. You know, it took me a while to figure out that organic love for music. I'm gonna be totally honest. Now I love it, obviously. But it took me a while to get there. And adults that come to me already love music. So that step's already reached. So it, it definitely helps, you know, but adults have forgotten what it feels like to be at zero knowledge, you know, and that's terrifying. But if you feel like you have any interest in taking lessons, take this as a sign to do it. It's worth it, trust me, because researchers have long since been saying that playing a musical instrument at any age is proven to reduce levels of stress hormones like cortisol. It also enhances your memory capacity and your spatial reasoning, which is great as we get older. It's also helpful for general life skills. So win-win, right? I also have linked a couple more studies about these kinds of things in the description box below. So if you have any interest and you want a little bit more bolstering, don't worry, I got you. Go ahead and check it out. Another question that I got a lot in my last video was, you use the word color a lot. What does color mean in relation to your voice? Well, the short of it is that color is representative of the timbre or the, the tone or the unique qualities of any given pitch that helps us to determine more about it. For example, you can hear this piano play middle C. And you can hear me sing middle C. Uh, and there's a difference between the piano and me. That would be a difference in color. They are the same pitch, but we happen to pick up on the different frequencies and colors that make it unique. For example, I can sing the C like this. I can also sing it like Ah, I can sing it like this. Ah. These are all different colors. It helps us to recognize different voices as well. So we can change our colors in an effort to get different emotions across and other stuff. So I hope that some of you guys found the answers interesting. I enjoyed making this video. It was really fun. And if you have any other questions, I would love to continue making these Q&A videos. So please, leave the comments 
down below and I will read through them. That is it for me tonight, my friends, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day slash evening, depending on when you're watching this, and please keep singing. What is this?